All right, welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to do a review of uh, Pike and Shot by um, Warlord Games. Uh, as if you've seen the channel before, as you know, I'm a really big fan of this period. Um, and these are the first rules I bought for it. Um, and I'm just going to give an overview of how it plays uh, and some of my thoughts on it. So just to start, I'll just um, flip through it for the presentation angle. Um, it's a Warlord book, so, I mean, it's really beautiful uh, as a book. Um, got a lot of great pictures um, and artwork. I think a lot of this is Osprey publishing artwork. But at any rate, I mean, just really nice. Uh, and... Um, it's really, uh, in terms of the layout, it's really, like, pleasant to read. Um, but when you're trying to quickly reference stuff while you're playing a game, um, that can be kind of difficult. So that's that's an issue I have with it. Um, but, you know, I mean, in terms of just, like, as a book to read, it's really nice. And, you know, for gameplay, there is a quick reference. Um, so that's... Um, you know, makes things easier, obviously. Um, so the basic structure, you know, if you're familiar with, like, Warlord Black Powder, I think it's pretty much the same or very similar at, at any rate. Um, so to do unit activation, it's, um, you know, I go, you go um, type of gameplay. So And then when you do unit activation, um, you each commander you have for your different um, battalion, which if we flip back... Um, different units, frontages, um, so, like, your army is going to be divided into different battalia, um, and so each commander of each battalia, uh, has a command value, and that's, um, going to be random, um, but that depends on the scenario you're playing and, or the period you're playing and, um, the army you're using. Um, but you roll against uh, your commander's value, um, and um, if you uh, roll a, if you roll three under whatever that value is on two dice, you two d six, um, you get a um, certain number of moves. So if it's three under, you get three moves. Uh, two under, two moves, and then if you beat it or by one, I believe it's you get one move. And so that's just, um, you know, one movement. Um, so, you know, you can move or, and you can even, um, and this is an issue I actually have with these rules is that also covers, um, a, uh, change a shift. So you can, um, move like for infantry at six inches. So you can move your unit six inches and, um, you know, kind of rotate them. That's considered, that's one move that's legal. Um, but then if you want to do like a formation change, which is pretty much only you're going to be in whatever your formation is. And then, um, a like marching column, um, you know, changing from that kind of formation is going to be one cost you one move. Um, but everything else, it's pretty fast and loose with that. Um, not really a fan of that. I, I think that kind of detracts from, you know, kind of the coordination these armies needed uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the finesse it kind of took to keep everyone in formation and moving. It's really important. Um, you know, if you've got a pike formation or a shot formation or, you know, even the cavalry, because they're having to move in a kind of tight formation if they're doing caracol shoot and then... Um, uh, you know, move back. Um, but, you know, kind of a minor thing. And, you know, the good thing and, and kind of a bad thing, depending on your perspective, I, I tend to think it's sort of a good thing is these warlord rules. It's really easy to house rule. So if you want to say, okay, if you want to make a, you know, if your unit wants to pivot or do something like that, you know, that costs a move, something like that. Um, so that's why I, I like these warlord rules. A lot of people don't think they're very historical, but I think they're a toolbox where if you want to house rule stuff and if you want to, you know, modify things, like if you're doing a really particular battle for a convention and you need um, just a basic framework that you're going to add to, I think these, these rules get the job done. Um, 
you have the different uh, units, unit types, the frontages, um, and so you know it gives you like like if you're a large unit for infantry, you typically get more shooting dice uh, if you're you know shot. Um, and the basing is pretty forgiving, so, you know, it's not based on the size of the base, like in Field of Glory Renaissance, it's, um, the frontage of the total unit, so that makes things pretty flexible, um, and, you know, I, I just tend to like using the Warlord, um, infantry and cavalry bases, I think it's the same dimensions for parry miniatures, too, just to make everything uniform, um, but... You know, if you have other bases or models from other collections, you know, it's not that not that difficult as long as you're meeting the frontage. Um, now, one thing in terms of, uh, like, basing and formations that I'm not a fan of in these rules is the way they represent these different um, brigades. So, in this way, they suggest you do it as kind of like a whole battalion formation. Um you know, which works if you have a lot of models, but I think my issue with it, because I do, I like to collect stuff that's for an imperialist or like a Spanish force, you know, because they used a lot of tercios. Um, it doesn't really represent that particular formation all that well, uh, at least in the core rules. I haven't looked at the um, 30 Years War supplement, but, you know, it's, you kind of have to line up your battalion like this and then your shot are like treated as detached units um, i've played this in the past where i've house ruled where um you know if you have like a single uh pike block and then your two wings of shot that like come in the box sets from warlord is treated as like a single unit um and uh and then you just form up the shot as like four uh horns on, on each corner uh, stuff like that. Um, that kind of works, and then give them a little more firepower, like an extra shooting dice. But um, anyway, you know, that's that's something, again, you can house rule, or you can just keep it the way it is. Um, but um, shooting is, you know, going into shooting. Um, oh, and activation, just one last note on activation. If you fail... Um, one of your orders tests for one of your commanders, your orders phase, uh, then concludes and your movement then concludes. Um, so, but, um, if you keep passing your orders tests, you can, you know, give out as many orders as, as you can, essentially, as long as you keep passing them. Uh, there's rules for terrain. Um, uh, shooting is really simple. So each unit has a profile with a certain number of shooting dice. You roll the dice indicated on the profile. Um, the target unit rolls a uh, morale save, um, and um, any unsaved hits are uh, treated as casualties, and that's checked against the target unit's stamina value. And then if the um, unit takes a certain number of hits, if it equals their stamina, uh, they, they become shaken. Um, and then you have these different morale test modifiers, formation modifiers from shooting. Uh, and then just to move ahead, um, we have artillery, uh, not, uh, the artillery rules I'm kind of mixed on. Um, so depending on, you know, your, your guns, so that's their max range. And then you get, you roll a certain number of dice for, um, how far you are so close range is three so it's three two one depending on um so six inches and then half of that value up there and then um over half is considered long range um i think they do this because they say oh the artillery in this period was kind of unreliable i think that does a disservice to the guns um uh, the heavy, you know, the field guns of this period, because, I mean, even as early as the Italian Wars, if you know anything about that, I mean, the French artillery were pretty effective against fortifications, uh, and, um, you know, and, and even the muskets and small arms were pretty effective on the battlefield, uh, like, you know, Battle of Fornovo, if you're familiar with that, I mean, so I think that kind of does a little disservice, um, but, Again, you can house rule it. And then the other issue I have with artillery, the way they handle it, is um, you can't really move it um, once it's set up. They say, because, well, the guns are really heavy and cumbersome, they can't be moved. 
Um, I don't really like that. I think that's a little, again, that does a little disservice. You know, if, it would be one thing if um, you were running like an Ottoman army, like if you're someone like me, and you have really big siege guns like the Ottomans had that were set up in like a metal frame. They weren't moved in like a limber. Um, that's one thing. But, you know, if you've got like the medium and heavy gun, this is from the Warlord uh, Ordnance Battery for a pike and shot from that box set. Um, you know, clearly that's somewhat mobile, uh, even if it's a heavy cannon. I mean, I think I feel like if you have a, you know, limber model or whatever it should have some degree of movement but um you know again something you can house rule um hand-to-hand -hand combat is pretty simple so you roll um a number of dice based on your um close combat value of your unit and then you know you get bonuses if you're charged like a bonus dice if you're charging um and then you know the defenders get to roll, and then whoever inflicted the most unsafe casualties in the end wins the combat. So it's uh, pretty similar to Warhammer 40,000. Um, and, you know, you've got a bunch of different modifiers, um, combat results, morale. Um, you know, like I said, if you're familiar with the Warhammer, this isn't that much different. Um, you know, you break tests if you've uh, inflicted a certain number of casualties on a unit over their stamina value. Um, and, uh, that's, uh, you know, how you basically remove units from the battlefield. Um, this is the victory conditions for most of the scenarios. Um, it, this is one thing where you really need a lot of models for this game. Um, because if you play with like one battalion, like I have, because it's, you know, about the number of figures in my collection. Um, once your battalion is, um, you know, half broken, then it's a, uh, broken unit. Um, so, you know, it doesn't really work, but if you have a lot of figures, you know, that's not an issue. Um, and then, uh, you have some extra rules. These are the advanced rules. Um, and there's also, uh, rules for command. And then you've also got like, again, like old, old school Warhammer 40,000, you've got, um, or older, I guess, uh, you've got, you know, some of these universal special rules. Um, I kind of like this. Uh, I like, I like this sort of system where, you know, gives some, uniformity and you don't have to keep checking for individual army rules um and then um the next section um and the next topic is to go over the scenarios so we've got uh, italian wars and then each um sort of scenario period has uh, army lists so like for italian wars we've got um imperialists uh and then we've got the French Valois period army. And, um, you know, these stat blocks are really simple. Just got hand-to-hand -hand value, uh, shooting value, morale, um, for the, which is their save, base armor save, basically. Uh, stamina and any special rule. And then there is a point system. Um... You know, if you're doing like a club or a convention game, you might not necessarily need this, but I mean, it can be helpful, I guess. Uh, ordinance. Um, and then the next, now there's uh, Pavia, very famous Italian Wars engagement, and it goes through, you know, kind of in a, you know, how they ran the scenario. Um, I'm not, I mean, I like these to read, but I'm not really a fan of this sort of thing being in a rule book. It's kind of cumbersome. Um, I would prefer, you know, just like a section of army lists. Um, and then, you know, maybe having like these scenarios in a, um, separate book potentially, um, got Tudor warfare in the British Isles, uh, you know, and again, I, I, the historical primer, that's, that's not the issue. It's just having like an in-depth battle scenario, uh, with like how the rules writers played it out. I, I can sort of take or leave that. Um, but it is fun to read, uh, you know, if you're just sitting and reading it, so, 
Um, I don't really know much about this period, so but uh, it's kind of kind of neat. Um, maybe somebody in the UK um, or people in the UK know more about it. It's not something here in the United States that is widely um, understood. Um, Thirty Years' War, big pike and shot period, and uh, there's uh, Count von Tilly, great great commander, great Catholic commander. Um, Wallenstein, another great Catholic imperialist commander, um, gives you like an overview and, um, you know, it's really beautiful. But like I said, it, it, it's really kind of cumbersome to navigate this sometimes if you're playing, you know, I mean, like I made photocopies of this, but, um, for, you know, my home games, but, uh, you know, if you're just flipping through, not that, not that, uh, easy, um, you know, most of these lists, I, I have to say, are, are quite good for the Western European um, armies, I think. They give you, you know, quite a good, good variety of units. Um, oh, they even give you colors for both both sides, the Evangelical Union and the um, you know, Imperialist and Catholic League. Um, and one thing uh, that is not that great about this is they focus on Western European armies a lot so which are the most popular so it's understandable um but if you want to do eastern stuff like they've got they do have a polish army list and they've got an ottoman list um which i have some issues with but you know i, I, don't, I don't like to be too harsh on on them because this is kind of a especially ottomans and poles um maybe not poles as much but uh, really niche army and you know most people that want to do pike and shot it, it seems from what's on youtube and like on different war game blogs it's a lot of 30 years war and italian wars which is you know totally understandable um you know i i just have some nitpicks as a uh, historian of this you know sort of area janissary's shooting value too i mean you know i think they should be a three being like elite musketeers but again, not a huge deal. Um, you know, if you're just getting into this and you really want to do like an Ottoman and, and Habsburg game or Ottomans versus, um, uh, you know, poles, th this will get the job done. Um, you know, and, uh, and what other scenarios we have? Well, there is a, um, oh, this is for 30 years war, uh, imperialist versus Swedish. Um, English Civil War, of course. Uh, that's another big popular area for this period. A uh, lot of uh, English Civil War colors. Um, Royalists, and you've got Parliamentarians, of course. New Model Army. Uh, Scots Covenanters. Uh... Montrose. Oh, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, and then this is the scenario that they did. And uh, as you can see, I mean, if you have the resources like these guys do and the models, I mean, you can use like a make like a really huge table and a lot of figures, which is kind of a down, kind of a downside to this set of rules. Um, and then the other, uh, I'm not super interested in English Civil War. Uh, in terms for war gaming, but um, and then let's see. Uh, well, you can really tell this is a UK made. Oh, uh, so you also have the Wars of the Grand Alliance against Louis the Fourteenth, um, and this is another era that I kind of like. Uh, haven't been able to research too much into it, but it is very neat. Age of Marlborough, Prince Eugene of Savoy um, gives you. An overview of the rules uh, and a uh, Grand Alliance army, uh, which I have one starter army from Warlord sitting in a corner that I haven't I bought for the pandemic and have not yet finished. Haven't even started most of it. Anyway, um, got the French and let's see. Got another battle scenario. Again, you can kind of see as I flip through this, when you're playing, this can be really cumbersome unless you photocopy stuff um, if you need to flip through for quick reference. Uh, you've got some scenarios. Um, if... Uh, 
you um, don't have a uh, a uh, quick reference like this. It, again, it's just cumbersome. Sorry to repeat myself. Um, you've got a point system, um, some other quick reference materials, um, some scale stuff. This is the Q QRS. Um, I think in I think they have this on their web on the Warlord website, and then just some advertisements in the back. Um, so one thing I would uh, recommend getting with this the Pike and Shot core book is a actually a uh, one second as I reach for it as a uh, black powder supplement. Uh, Last argument of kings. Um, as far as I can tell, it's pretty compatible, but mostly for if you want it for these few um, conflicts, so uh, not Austrian succession, but um, Spanish succession, Northern War, and um, this is, it's Storm on the Danube. This is for the basically for the Great Turkish War, um, and I think the uh, if I can get to it, the Ottoman list in this book is quite a lot, quite a bit better. Um, let me see, this is for Northern War. Yeah, um, you know, so like if you're interested in doing Great Turkish War, like Siege of Vienna in 1683, and the conflicts afterward, I think this is a decent book to get for the army lists. Um, and, um, yeah, so, and uh, it's pretty much compatible, um, you know, same basic rule set. So, but, um, overall, I mean, if I, I think if you are interested in this period, um, and you have the figures to do this, it's not a bad book to get if you want to run a convention game or you want to get maybe some friends into this because it's, the rules are really simple and it's pretty close to Warhammer. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, not bad. Um, and it's fun to read and really nice to look at like most World War Games books. Um, but if you don't have a lot of models or you're really a stickler for historical flavor and historical details, there's other options out there like Baroque uh, and um, Pikeman's Lament. Uh, Pikeman's Lament is sort of lower model count, um, you know, so if you're interested in that. Uh, but overall, I mean, I, 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 like, I like these Warlord rules, again, because they're easy to get into and they're really easy to house rule and modify if you need to. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, I suggest if you're interested in Pike and Shot, uh, maybe you get it, or, you know, if you don't necessarily want the whole big book, uh, they have a PDF option available. Um, so, uh, that's the review. I, I, I guess the main takeaway is, um, like I said, I'm kind of mixed on it. I like it in a lot of ways, but there's also some issues. Uh, but then, at the same time, like I said, stuff is easy to modify, so I, I can't really be too critical um, and, uh, Warlord's pretty upfront that most of the rule sets are meant for casual sort of club play, uh, which is, you know, doesn't bother me at all, um, because that's the kind of player I am in general. So, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.